Hey, welcome to the uh, new normal of the Fireside Tattoo Podcast, where I just uh, sit in this room with my headphones on and talk to people on a computer screen instead of drinking beers with people in real life. Thank you, COVID. Uh, I was really excited to be part of the third virtual tattoo gathering, Guy Aitchison's virtual tattoo gathering. Thanks to Guy and Gabe for involving Fireside in it. Uh, once again, we've been part of two of the first three, and it's really a cool thing that they're starting to put together. If you or if you haven't been involved in it, uh, you should definitely go to virtualtattoogathering.com and just uh, look at what all they have there. It's all done live, and then they uh, they uh, set it all up for replay, so you can go in and watch all the uh, all the stuff that you missed. This episode you're about to watch or listen to uh, came from the last virtual tattoo gathering, and it is featuring my uh, or it features, I should say, my uh, great great friend Ty Pilata, and we're talking a little technical tattoo stuff. We're talking about short versus long stroke, we're talking about needle tapers, we're talking about machines, skin saturation, all kinds of nerdy tattoo stuff that you may or may not be interested in. I want to thank my uh, other great friend, uh, Million McGow, Art of Million on, uh, on Instagram for, uh, uh, for sending us a handful of questions along with his co-workers at 46 and 2 Studio in North Dakota. I was going to put out questions for for all of you guys to ask us, but then I asked Million first and he sent us like 10 or 12 questions, so we just used his because they were all really good. So I hope you enjoy the episode. Uh, let's kick it off. We're going to start by talking about uh, the difference in uh, stroke length, short stroke versus long stroke machines. So let's just jump right in right there with my buddy Ty Pilata. As far as like short stroke versus long stroke, that also depends on the way people tattoo. Uh, some people really uh, like a shorter stroke machine. Uh, because it takes less time to cycle. So there's more punctures per second if you've got that thing running at a faster yeah. speed than there would be uh, at that same voltage with a longer stroke because it's going to take a little bit longer to get through that stroke. Um, where I guess that would come into play, and I've noticed this on a lot of machines, uh, it doesn't really matter as much shorter stroke versus longer stroke as it does the, um, the X center on the machine or the counterweight. That goes that spins around as the needles are coming down. I've noticed that the bigger the counterweight, um, it's going to hit harder regardless of whether or not it's a shorter stroke or longer stroke. And I've had my you know better success with a machine that has a lighter uh, a lighter counterweight. I do prefer a longer stroke, uh, depending on the machine as well. But um, I feel it, uh, it it you know I can hang what I want out of the skin, but it coming back up higher into the tube. I feel like it's picking up a little more ink to pull back down when the stroke is longer than it is when the stroke is too short. Oh, okay. And again, that's just that's just preference and feeling. I, I do feel like a longer stroke also saturates better um, because I work with a little bit of give on my machine. Uh, that's something that I'm uh, trying to get used to on the NUMA. I'm waiting for Carson Hill to send out some cams that he just designed. Uh, his 20% cam on a, it's a 3.6 that I have now. He just went up to a 4.2 cam for lining. I can drop 15 round liners with uh, that 3.6, but I do feel like when I'm on thicker skin, like working on a stomach or something, I just want a little bit more. So I know that 4.2 is going to be great. But what that's not great for for me in this, the way that I'm tattooing is it's great for lining, but that 20% cam doesn't work as well for shading and coloring which is why he just came out with a 28 and a 38. Uh, so that's the, that's the percentage of the time that the needle's in the skin. So your 28, I'm not really sure what you could compare that to, maybe a standard rotary. And I'm assuming the 38% is more like a swash plate, like you have on your Cheyenne pens or like a swash drive machine. Mm -hmm. uh, that's also the Scorpion setup is also a swash plate. So I think that that 38 percenter is what I'm going to want to do that's going to replicate what I'm used to feeling with the shader, you know? Mm, okay. um, and I can still color with uh, that um, 20 percent, but it just, it, uh, it doesn't saturate as quickly. So I'm, you know, running the machine a little faster to compensate for the fact that it's not saturating as quickly. Uh, but, you know, it popping in and out of the skin faster, though, it does leave very nice blends and shades if you want to work slower. Mm. Um, but when you really want to just, you know, hammer down and, and get moved. And I think that the, the 28 and 38 that he's coming out with are going to be better color packers than the 20 percenter. Gotcha. Um, I know I got a little off topic with that, but th thinking of the stroke length made me think of that machine, especially. Um, and the Scorpion is a four millimeter 
and that thing, I mean, that thing saturates like a dream, man, and that's a swash plate too. So uh, I've always seemed to have better saturation with those longer strokes, and I don't know if it is that theory that it carries more ink out of the cartridge because it's going further up into the tube, and, you know, pulling more down with it. I, I think so. Um, I mean, in, in that regard, the, uh, uh, what is that, Injecta Nano, that thing came, I think most people used a 3.2 on that. And that thing saturates too. So I guess it's all on what you're used to. And in that case, that would be probably more of that 28%, uh, just standard, you know, cycle of a, like, like a direct drive kind of cycle, you know? Um, gotcha. So what would be, what, what, give the, um, the variables for a stroke. What would be a, the, the, about the shortest stroke machine uh, it, it, in, the, in the longest? Is it like three so, to four and a half or two? Three would be the most common. I think, um, I'm not sure if Bishop, but uh, Neotat had like a 2.6 or something like that, which they said was great for black and gray. Carson Hill has a 2.7 stroke, but that's still a 20% 2.7. So that's also probably good for black and gray. I tried color work with that 2.7 versus the 3.6, and I didn't see much of a difference, like saturated the same. Um, it seemed like it took the same amount of time, only naturally I'm hanging the needle closer to the edge of the tube tip in the resting position. And it, you know, with a, the longer stroke, it's gonna sit higher up in the tube in the resting position. Uh, but I couldn't see much of a difference between those two strokes as far as like smoother, or less aggressive or anything like that. Um, and then uh, the longest strokes are, the longest standard shader stroke, I believe would be like a four to a 4.2. Uh, and then uh, Bishop Wand has that 5.0, which is technically just a liner. Uh, that thing's a nice liner too. Uh, but I, I think uh, pound for pound, the, the Numa is even better, even though it's only got a 3.6 and that Bishop's 5.0. It's because um, it, it snaps in and out of the skin really fast. So there's no drag. Like with the Bishop, even on that 5.0, no matter how fast you're running it, you're waiting for it. Because if you pull too fast, you're just going to be dragging it across the skin while it's still in the skin, where that Numa retracts like instantly. So you can move your hand as fast as you want without creating extra trauma. Okay. Um, that, that leads us to uh, a question further down the list, I believe, from, from Million about... Uh, liner preferences but uh mm -hmm. i guess we yeah, should go in order there um, uh, we don't have to go in order uh, we can we can bounce around um yeah what you're talking okay. about is uh line number, uh, number type six. Preferred lining so techniques the preferred lining techniques like uh i know guys like baxter they like to build up a line mm -hmm. um i've always liked to pull a line uh for for me uh watching nick's seminar he builds up a line and he says that his lines stay uh more crisp and true and dense and solid when he builds them up that way. When I've ever tried to build up that way, all I've ever had was like some light spots and lines and some scarring and stuff like that. It just, that technique doesn't work for me. Maybe it's just the time frame that I was brought up as a tattooer and, you know, trained to pull one pass lines kind of thing. Um, because I definitely prefer uh, just getting in there, dropping it with one pass and getting out. And um, with the Bishop 5.0, uh, my, my probably most consistent lines besides the Dan Coven uh, were the Bishop. And then my most consistent line work ever now has been the Numa. Uh, that's just incredible. And I think it has to do with that cam. Um, but for me, the, the sharpest edges on a line, so I'm dropping um, quadrant 15 round shaders with one pass with both the Bishop and the Numa. And uh, the, the edge, it's hard to describe to you when you look at it it's super sharp on the edges. Hmm. And I think, um, I think it has to do with the percentage of time it's in the skin is less than like on a swash plate. Cause I would never get a clean, crisp, dense line out of a swash plate like I do with uh, the Numa 4. So that more replicates what a coil would. It replicates, I guess, um, you know, no drag in the skin. And I think that's where with cartridges, especially you always get no matter how steady your hand is, you're pulling a line, it's beautiful. All of a sudden you look and there's a wiggle in the line. And you're like, where did that come from? Because yeah. the cartridge, the back of the cartridge is a little sloppy and that would create a little bit of a jiggle. But with that 20% stroke that Numa has, that thing snaps and pops like up out of the skin so quick, there is no wiggle and no walk because it's not, it's not hanging in the skin long enough to create a walk. Mm -hmm. So I've been, I've been getting, I mean, it's a weird machine because I'm getting from a 15 liner, super crisp, 
all the way down to like a number eight type three bug pen uh, with a fine line, like with that same cam on it, that same counterweight. And it's not too aggressive. It's not blowing out. It's not cutting the skin. It's just, I mean, it's just an awesome liner, man. Yeah. I love that thing. I, I just actually messaged Baxter about that machine, uh, about the uh, Carson's, uh, the NUMA. Uh, yesterday we were talking about it and he, he agreed he really loves it he, and, he, and he mentioned exactly what you just said he said if we could just get cartridge makers to you know to keep the, from the side to side wobble in in, in yeah. their cartridges then, I, then I, it would feel great he you know he came up using coils and he's always looking for a rotary that that more closely resembles a coil machine and yeah. I, I actually reached out to him asking which of those um, cams he got because it was a little confusing to me I jumped on the site actually I think I texted you as well I oh, jumped on the site and, and I was going to buy one and I was like I have no idea which of these things to get I didn't even realize no. that the that 20 percent meant time in the skin I mean yeah. I knew what the stroke length was but so, I didn't know what the 20 percent was yeah so if you look at the cam wheel uh, it'll be like a, like a flat wheel and it'll have a sine wave in it that comes up and then down so oh. it's literally a sine wave and that sine wave is like so around this cylinder, uh, you see it like this, around that cylinder, it's completely flat. And then you'll see a little hump up and back down like a hill almost Yeah. on the horizon, you know? And that's 20% of that complete cylinder is in and out. So it's in the skin 20% and then the rest it's up and out. Mm. So it's definitely a, a cool technology. He can make endless cams, endless percentages, like whatever you want your machine to be mimic or hit, he's going to be able to create with this thing. So I'm glad he's got a patent on it because it's a real game changer. Uh, when I first picked up the machine, I was using the stainless grip. And to me, it felt a little heavy because we've been so like programmed for disposable grips for so long and lightweight machines. Um, so I ended up buying the aluminum grip from him. I might have used it once or twice and then put the stainless one back on just like to be able to it reminds me of a coil where you would just be able to, you know, hold the grip really light in your hand, but the grip would be the counterweight. So you'd be able to rest the machine on top of your hand. Now I'm kind of just resting the machine on the skin to do my work. And I don't have to, like I do with a lighter weight machine, I'm pushing the entire time I'm tattooing, which is kind of making me a little more fatigued over the length of the tattoo, mm. where this way, I, you know, you don't have to keep a tight grip on it at all. And the weight of the machine being completely upright and the weight of that stainless grip uh, just keeps it in place. So the stainless is what I prefer to use, especially if I'm dropping like uh, any line work at all. It's just nice for the machine to stay right where it's supposed to be when you're pulling. You know? Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, let's jump onto one of these others. We have a few. Uh, uh, well, let's, let's keep you on. We were talking needles. Um, these two, questions two and three are kind of the same, the difference between the long and short needle taper and the and the pros and cons of I'm sorry not the difference between a long and short taper which we can talk about what what that actually means but the pros and cons of uh, long versus short needle tapers uh, and also the pros and cons of bug pin versus standard needle sizes okay so um, I'll generally always work with long taper uh, versus medium taper and it depends on whether or not the machine can push those medium tapers um, as efficiently because the shorter the taper is it's going to you know, you're going to reach the maximum dot size of that that taper allows in a shorter distance. So I think it takes a little bit more, um, a little more torque to, to get a medium taper into the skin than it will a long taper. Uh, but if the machine's hitting right, I mean, essentially, if you're just packing color, you're going to pack color faster uh, because it's going to be a bigger dot on a medium taper than it will a long taper. Um, but I seem to have like less trauma on the skin and less of a chance of overworking or you know beating up an area with a longer taper pin than than a medium taper because pretty much with that medium taper once that thing's saturated there's not too much more layering you can do you got to let that thing heal first where a medium uh, you know that long taper needle I could be completely saturated and I can still go back and like crack some white highlight or something to lighten up an area. I can go back in and hit a little black to deepen an area and like no healing issues whatsoever. Mm -hmm. Whereas with a medium taper, I would, even if it's still healed all right, you'd be able to see on the surface of the skin where it was like too broken, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so that was, that's been my experience with medium tapers. And as far as like bug pins versus standard needles go, I'm always back and forth with this. And I'm coming to the conclusion, so I think, that it depends on the person's skin. Um, 
the long long taper, um, like a standard 12, will give you uh, more needle marks. So it's not going to be as smooth looking, even if it's buttery, you can see all the needle marks. To me, it's more of like a like a painterly look to a piece of art. It's a little looser. Uh, whereas the bug pins, you know, the dots are so small, it's much it's a much more refined look. I've been able to um, saturate with the same machine, like with the with the scorpion pen. Whether I'm using bug pins or standard, I can saturate the same, although the look is completely different. Where I have had some inconsistencies in, I think it's the person's skin, because I could take um, somebody, you know, we use a standard 12 long taper on them with that scorpion pen. And I'm halfway through the tattoo and I'm like, good Lord, this thing looks beat up as hell. What the fuck is going on, right? Like I check my needles under a, um, a loop, which nobody does anymore these days, but I still do that because I'm yeah. from the 90s. Um, and I'm like, okay, yeah, no, this is all great. I'm like, what the hell is the difference? And then I'll, I'll grab a bug pen mag and I'll start shading with a bug pen mag and it's doing so much less trauma to that person's skin. But then I'll do my next tattoo and I'll be like, I don't really feel like using the bug pins today. I think I'll use the standard 12. And that person's got great elasticity in their skin and, you know, working on something for seven hours and it's just super smooth as silk. Uh, the dots are bigger, like I said, because it's a bigger diameter needle, but it's like perfect. I'm like, yeah, same machine, same settings, different customer. And that's the only difference to like, you know, something looking a little more or less beat up. So I'm thinking overall, that bug pin, although it's making a smaller dot, which may slow some people down a little bit, it's not gonna add that much more time to your tattoo, but if you're having like trouble with the, the skin looking a little, you know, a little rough, I think the bug pin kind of smooths that out. And I've had zero issues with today's pigments actually saturating well with a bug pin, where back in the day you wanted like a standard 12 with like a medium taper that was all textured and stuff to punch that pigment into the skin. You know, these pigments we're using now are, th those particles are so damn small. The smallest bug pen on earth is going to pack black, you know. Yeah. For, you know, that's the experience I've had using, you know, which is kind of cool that I'm using the same shader uh, with cartridges to use the bug pins and the standards and still getting the same results going. Okay, so it's not that I need like a longer stroke punchier shader with a standard 12 to, to pack in some color. I can use the same soft you know, it's a uh, swash plates to me are very smooth in their cycle, which is why I think that 38 cam from the Noom is going to be pretty sick. Um, but uh, to be able to get that same machine to use both bug pins and standards without any, you know, you know, need for a punchier or a softer hitting machine, that to me says like, you know, uh, it's more the customer with, you know, your, your, the look of the skin when you're working than it is you. Because I think we've all been through that where, we know we're doing what we, what we normally do day in and day out. You know, machines running fine, the needles aren't, you know, hooked or barbed or anything. And what the hell's the problem? It's gotta be the customer. So that's something I'll do now where I never did it in the past. I used to just say, you know, chalk it up to this person's skin not being as good and I just keep running with my standard 12s. Now I've got them in the drawer, I'll be like, hmm, all right, hang on a minute, let me grab a bug pen. And that'll usually settle out that problem. It's not on a lot of people though. Like you could generally work on, you know, uh, anyone with anything and it'll still look good but when people get that you know rough looking skin the bug pin seems to be much much better for that that's interesting yeah i hadn't thought i hadn't thought about that i've never tried it and i but i do know the the issue when every once in a while like everything it, you're doing everything the way you always do and for whatever reason you're just not getting saturation the skin is is overly yeah. irritated i never thought to try a bug pin i I always had it in my head, the same thing you addressed earlier, that I, I used bug pins, or I still use bug pins for, for smooth black and gray, but I always had it in my head that uh, thicker pigments, you know, I, 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 I didn't yeah. want to use bug pins because I felt like the hole that I'm poking might be smaller than the particles of pigment that I'm trying to put into the skin. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I think that um, getting away from that mentality is probably better these days because these pigments aren't the same as the patterns we were using back then. Yeah. 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 Um, okay. Let's move on. Let's grab one of these. Others. I'd like to hit a few of these, a uh, few of these if we can. Um, machine wrapping methods for cleaner uh, setups and teardowns. I, you know, that's, that's particular to the machine. We're, uh, I'm using mostly pin style machines with a battery pack and I basically yeah. just use a sandwich bag and Coban. Yeah. Uh, you know, that's a, the, the same. If a, if a machine's thin enough, I'll throw a clipboard bag over it. Um, the ink machines has a, a disposable grip, but the Numa 4, that stainless grip is one that, um, you know, I throw a bag over the whole thing. 
and then um, wrap coban around the bag. Uh, and then when I'm done, I just make sure that there's no visible ink on anything. The spring inside the grip pops out, so you can pull it out with your finger. Um, he said to put it back in with like a dental tool or like a paper clip that you bend. If I stick my finger in there and push it all the way down, the spring reseats itself just fine. Um, but what's cool is it does all come apart. It's just a spring and a grip. And, um, you know, this, what's nice about the stainless is you can see whether or not there's ink on there. And when there's no ink on there and you soak it in that aside and everything, you're good to go. The bag is going to protect almost everything. But even if you get a, a case where, you know, some ink splatters, you can see whether or not you're physically clean and then soaking it in the mat aside is fine. You know, some people will disagree with that theory, like everything needs an autoclave, but like if you're wrapped in a bag and you're wrapped in Coban and you're not a complete, you know, idiot and you have, you know, regard and, you know, decency for cleanliness and hygiene as a tattooer, you're not going to hurt anybody with a mat aside and a clean grip, you know? Right, right. That's my feeling on it at least. Yeah, I, I do the same. I disassemble my grip and just why I use the mat. I got away from using um, spray mat aside. I just I felt like I was breathing it in so much yeah. that I, I just you, I just use the wipes now. So I'm, it's never in the yeah. air. Uh, so that's what I always did too, uh, was just use the wipes. But um, we had so many gallons of mat aside that we bought right before the shutdown because the wipes yeah. were running out. Uh, so we bought bottles and gallons too. And what I'll do is I'll just squeeze the trigger really gently on my spray bottle so that it falls and doesn't mist. Mm. Um, so I'm still able to soak my surfaces without creating an aerosol. Mm. Uh, you just have to be careful when spraying it. But I, what sucks is like working with people who are literally like, you know, they've got the spray bottle like wild less and they're fucking spraying their table from three feet away. And you're like, dude, that's <laughs> why are we drinking yeah. this stuff in? Like easy, take it easy. Right, right. Um, uh, let me pull one of these others up. I, I, I like, I like this question. It's something I'd like to, it's something I talk about a lot during our technique episodes and, and people ask about a lot, uh, is, uh, reading the skin. They said they, they wanted tips on learning to read the skin. And by, by that, I think they mean like the uh, skin trauma as, you know, as they're working, reading saturation yeah. versus trauma, you know, with our, our goal being to get the greatest amount of saturation with the least amount of, of skin trauma and how to tell if that's actually happening or not uh do you um uh we could break that down in a dozen different ways probably you know with, with if you're talking about light colors you know uh, uh or we're talking about black or you know i i um I, go, go ahead what, what do you think what do you think what are you doing whenever you use a lot of pastel kind of tones and big fields uh gradients and things like that i see you using a lot of like soft blues and some of your ladies faces and stuff like that yeah how are you, how, how are you thinking about the skin um, you know, yeah, I, I guess I do think about the skin like to the point where uh, those colors for me, I work with brands that I that I don't have that problem or where some people's green or lime green you'll pack in and all you see after you pack it in is blood, you know, and you got to wait for the blood to settle. I, I want to see the pigment. Um, so I'll work with a color from a different brand that, that shows right away and doesn't show the blood. Like I had a lot of problems with some of the Eternals greens. Uh, so I use fusion screens and those things, they go in the skin and you can see them where you're not looking at just this giant field of, you know, blood waiting it for it to settle. But as far as saturation goes, seeing the amount of blood or clear fluid bubble up to the surface, that's one good way to know you have a good saturation. Um, with the bug pins especially, but also on the right skin with the standard 12s, when you make your pass, you will see that it's solid pretty instantly. Um, I really don't have like that thing where I go back a lot these days, unless I'm working with like flesh tones. If I'm working with flesh tones and they're, you know, light colors on light, light skin to begin with, I'll just spray the soap bottle and let, let it sit on, like all that liquid sit on the surface and shine a light on it to see whether or not there's anything missing. Um, but with most colors, you don't really need to do that. You can, you can see that it's saturated and then solid, you know? Yeah. Um, I think that's just time and experience for a lot of people too. Um, yeah, I think it's a balance. Uh, I, I think it's a, a balance of, of learning to um, uh, learning to, to, to feel the saturation. You were talking about, you know, you, you're relying on yeah. how it feels always, going in the skin. You always feel the vibration in your yeah. right hand. Yeah, so, so pretty often I, I know before I even wipe how saturated it is just because I can feel the vibration, you know, in my yeah. hand. And then I, I think also it's, uh, uh, it has a lot to do with the technique of that of that tattoo or you you do a lot of single pass lines and your color fills are are, are are solid and you work kind of from a to b 
and you're a fast tattooer. We, we tattoo together a lot over the years and, uh, and you're a lot faster than I am. I tend to work in layers. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll lay a base layer in and then come back and sculpt on top of it or, or, yeah. or blend darker, dark and light. I, I, don't, I don't use the traditional kind of dark to light uh, right. thing yeah. that, that we were always taught. And, uh, and so it's probably more important for me to know how worked that skin is, knowing that I, I want to come back and put a second layer on than it is yeah. for you to know because you're trying to get it all done in a single pass. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, if there, there's room for error too where I am getting something done in a single pass and there is a light spot, I know I can go back and hit it one more time. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I do, I do do my blending as I go versus building. Um, especially with standard 12s, even if they are a long tapered, you're gonna, it, it's less forgiving using uh, a standard 12 than it would be a bug pin where, you know, if you're used to building with a 12, but you hit a point where you're like, that's it, I'm done. If you were building with a bug pin, you may get one pass more, two passes more mm -hmm. before you hit that point where you, you gotta wait it out until it heals up, you know? Right. And that's, that's something I've noticed. It seems like, it, for me, it seems much more difficult, even though it, it looks 100% saturated, you still have like room for so much more with a bug pin because of how tiny that hole is, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, but the one thing that is a little more difficult, although the blending is good with a bug pin, since they're smaller, I feel like in larger areas, the blending is better with standard 12s, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, I've noticed even if I look at one thing I did with bug pins versus another thing I do with the 12, I might gradients are much better with a 12 and they're more or less somewhat blended with a bug pin. But I'll have areas where like one color stops, then another color just starts because the bug pin dots are so small. It would have, you know, it would have been a lot more building and blending to get to that same point where I am just packing, you know? Yeah. So I think that's just um, that get in and get out mentality, I suppose. Not like rushing, but actually just trying to be my most efficient to get you know, on larger work, uh, a chunk done, you know? Yeah, yeah. Uh, we, we got a comment from, um, I may I may mess up this name, Celte, C-E-L-T-A-E, -E, said a nice tip on the eternal greens. Uh, I normally wait it out, but I'll definitely look into fusion greens. Green is what is like the uh, the beginning tattooer's worst nightmare, all greens, because yeah, they, they yeah. yeah, I made the mistake for so long of overworking greens, thinking that they were uh, uh, Celte, I was right. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, what was I going to say? Oh, I, I made the mistake for years that greens always looked very spotty and I would try to go back and saturate them. And really what you have to do is kind of wait them out and see how yeah. saturated they are. Let's let that irritation kind of settle back down. I will add to that since somebody's interested. Um, for blues and greens, I use fusion, but everything that I'm cutting, if I'm using a yellow, it's never going to be like a star bright watery yellow. It's always going to be an opaque yellow that has white in it, like the bumblebee from Eternal. Uh, and I think the heavier white mixed into that yellow, even though it's still a bright enough yellow, like I've never used uh, in years star bright or like lightning yellow or anything like that. I always just use bumblebee because of the type of work that I, I like, I like the look of it. But I think the white is so heavy that in that yellow mixed with the green, that's what keeps you from seeing more blood than pigment. You always see more pigment. And I think it's the heavier base. Whereas if you were working with a kind of watery green and a watery yellow, you're definitely gonna see all that blood getting in your way, you know? Yeah. Um, so that's something that's always made those easier for me to, to get in solid saturation first time is, you know, throw a little bumblebee yellow in there if you're mixing with yellow or, you know, like a quality white. I'll use Fusion's white or um, use an Empire's white now. It dries quick, but I really love Empire's white, man. That's a great uh, solid white by itself or even for blending. Mm, yeah, I've been using Empire's gray wash sets uh, since uh, they gave away a couple of years ago. Well, it's been several years ago and now, I guess, that they gave those yeah. big sets away at Hell City. At Hell City, yeah. And um, I used the, that whole set and loved it. And I actually just bought their white wash series with a couple of drops of white. You know, some people will drop yeah. white in their gray. Yeah. So I, I bought that just to try it out. And I just started uh, shading a, a full sleeve that I posted uh, something on my story about. I don't think I put it in my feed. It's really cool, especially when you get yeah. to the light end of it, like the lightest whitewash. Yeah, it's almost it's a like, nice gray. Yeah, yeah, it's nearly an opaque light gray, but yeah. not quite. And yeah. uh, I'm really excited to, to see how it settles in on this tattoo. Uh, I haven't yeah, seen like, it healed yet. 
like where you, where it'll be, you know, two years or five years from now, will it look exactly the same or will it turn into more of a traditional gray wash as that white kind of dissipates? Yeah, you know? I don't know. I, I wonder if know. it never does. I wonder if it stays that gray. It'd be pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. Uh, um, yeah, that, I'm, I'm really excited to see how that, how that, how that does settle in. One thing, oh, yeah. uh, I'm gonna, one thing I wanted to say, um, uh, as far as reading the skin, something I've been doing, and I got this from Jeff Ensminger tattooing me years ago, is I use Bactine, not like most tattooers use Bactine. I use probably two full bottles on a tattoo. Uh, I, I do one tattoo yeah. a day, maybe six or seven right. hours. I two pour two, yeah, two bottles a session. I pour it into my Nalgene bottle and I wipe with, with straight Bactine rather than okay. soap and water. And it keeps that redness down so much that yeah. I can see all of my, I can see the skin uh, so clearly because there's no, there's no right. redness or swelling in my way. That's interesting. So it doesn't make the skin spongy at all. It, Not it at just all. flattens everything right out. That's cool. Yeah. I yeah. had a little left over from one client. So I used a little bit of it towards the end of a tattoo for a person. Mm -hmm. And I didn't, I didn't notice a difference in the skin as much as I noticed a difference in them. Oh, a yeah. little bit of Bactine I'm wipe, I was wiping with. They went from the point of no return where they were ready to just call it quits to just sitting there relaxing. And I'm like, person's not jumping they're not flinching or tensing up anymore like ah okay so i'm wondering if like i can make those six or seven hour sessions um much more tolerable to the person for the person where people are going to want to sit longer yeah you know? absolutely and, yeah yeah i, 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 I you used I, to sit for six or seven hours yourself yeah. right yeah yeah on, on your Every, torso yeah. on my torso i was sitting for six or seven hours with jeff and then my clients all sit for six or seven hours and the thing is and i had this um a little bit of this talk with marcus leonard uh, in a podcast recently you know he he is of the opinion uh and and i think jeff gogway was the was the same way when we had him on the show of that tattoos need to hurt that it's part of the part of the experience and um yeah. and I, I i get that but i i um I like my clients to leave thinking it was a really pleasant experience and looking forward to the time that, to, to when they come back. Absolutely. I don't really want them leaving. Go like when their appointments are coming up, I don't want them dreading having to sit and yeah. for six hours. Yeah, I, I agree with that, man. I don't, I don't, I don't think you need to earn your tattoo. You, you're yeah. paying out the ass for it already. So <laughs> right. why not make it a peaceful, relaxing experience as much as possible, which yeah. we know it's never going to get rid of a hundred percent of the pain, but even as a tattooer, I, if I'm going to sit for something large myself, I don't want to be in discomfort for the last three to four hours of the session. Like, you know, anything you could do. I always have clients doing bigger work. I'm like, you know, I'm not prescribing anything to you, but just so you know, when I get tattooed, I'll take like three or four Advil before the session starts. Halfway through, I'll take another two or three Advil. It's not going to kill you. You're only doing it once for that day. And then again, three weeks or a month from now, you know? So yeah. if that's going to help, you know, why not take it? And most of the time they'll be like, oh, I took a, a couple Advil uh, for breakfast this morning before we started and I brought a couple extra. Those people always sit better, man. Now, I don't know if it's, you know, mostly psychological, but I think it, you know, it could take it down from, from a nine to a seven, who knows? And anything is better than nothing. So yeah. uh, I, I'm, you know, I'm curious to try that. I'm going to see if I can find like a good case price on like Amazon or something, a back team. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know who has it just as cheap or cheaper than Amazon uh, is Kingpin. Uh, they just do it in oh, the four ounce bottles. You can buy like yeah. a five pack of them, and it okay. averages out to like maybe five dollars a bottle. Whereas if I go to CVS, they're like eight to eleven dollars yeah. a bottle. They like they'll yeah. they, they'll kill you at, at Walgreens or CVS. But but right. yeah, I've tried to buy them on um, on Amazon, and I keep coming back and buying them from Kingpin. The only thing, the ones from Kingpin are the, like, I like the ones that are in the full spray bottle because I can pop the cap off and just pour it in my Nalgene. Yeah. The ones that Kingpin, it just, it's the one that has like the little hole in the top. So you have to like squeeze and squeeze and squeeze. Oh, it like you. shoots a stream. Yeah. So it yeah. takes like, you know, a full minute to squeeze one out into your Nalgene right. bottle. Not a big deal. It's just kind of annoying. Right. Uh, yeah. But um, w one other thing I would say for people who are struggling with, uh, with reading the skin or seeing how saturated something is, is if, when you're finishing a session or finishing a, a tattoo, get some good close-up photographs of the areas that are suspect to you. Like if you feel like, ah, oh, that area might not heal well yeah. or this area yeah. looks good. And then, and then compare it to the healed photo or to the, to the healed tattoo when you see it again. I think that's one of the better ways to learn. That the camera sees what your eye can't. It's pretty amazing actually. Um, and then once you see it on your photo, looking in again at the tattoo, you're like, oh shit, how did that get away from me? Because I've taken my final photos several times and I'm looking at my photo and I'm like, wait, 
hold on a second, and then I'll tell the person to sit back down in the chair and get back into that spot real quick. One, one more hour. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, that, that has helped me a lot, too. And that, that was just by chance. I think we may have spoke about that, or you mentioned that one of the first times we, we were online here. Um, and I never noticed it before that, how much, how much the photo will tell the truth versus what your eye can see. Yeah, yeah. I, whenever, whenever I photograph a tattoo, I usually tell them, I think we're finished. Let me get a photo and then I'll tell you for sure. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Is that, yeah, I always, you always see it more uh, on the photo. Um, all right, let me see. Let's, let's move on. We've spent a little time on that. Um, tips on reading the skin. We talked about uh, lining techniques. Oh, um, well, they want to know a cleaning method, uh, needle cleaning method during color changes. Um, I've, I've kind of started experimenting with, uh, with a few things. I use, um, uh, I got a ton of s eights needle cleaner. They just gave me a freaking case of it. Uh, and so basically what you do is you like put a little, it's a pump bottle and you put a little squirt of it in your um, rinse cup. And before you start tattooing, you run the machine in it and it coats the needles uh, so, that, uh, so that they'll clean easier and not gunk up. I use that. And then in addition to that, I've gotten to where I really like these little um, sponges. What are they called? Dip caps. Yeah, the dip caps. Do you use those? Okay. I don't, but I see people using them and I'm like, that is so weird to me. Like, I'm just, you know, I'm like, I don't get it, but I, I need to try stuff like that before, before I like laugh about it because <laughs> it seems to be so many products that you can get wrapped up in. And before you know it, there's like 60 or 80 bucks laying on your setup yeah. before you even start tattooing, you know? Yeah, yeah that but, is um, true. That is true. Yeah, Baxter, but, um, everyone Baxter that has... Everyone that I've talked to that uses them, just they love them. So I guess it is something to try, but it is something that once you get used to tattooing with it, then you run out and it, it fucks up your whole day. Hey, yeah. So yeah. I'm just like, if I don't have like from like a true grip or from my scorpion pen, if I've got the disposable grip, I'll even wrap a paper towel around that and just tape it down to my station, use it as a rinse cap. Uh -huh. um, but if, if I don't have like a, a, you know, a true, a true rinse cup or, um, you know, a true grip on, on my tube i'll just use ink caps a couple extra ink caps and i'll just put water in like two ink caps and for oh. years i never used a rinse cup i just used an ink cap with some water in it really run the, run the needle in there really quick and then um run it on a paper towel like i've always with liners you have to be careful running on a paper towel so i don't really um but mags i've never had any paper towel gunk up in there and give me a problem so i've yeah. always just kind of cleaned out in a paper towel so I, i've caught it doesn't it take much either yeah, the, the same thing. is I've caught it with liners before. I used to just run mine on a paper towel, and I would pick up a uh, paper towel with, with my liners sometimes. Uh, what I do, and I, I got this from, from Baxter with that, uh, with that quick, or, I'm sorry, with the dip cap, is first off, you run it in there, and the needle comes out shiny, shiny clean, like brand yeah. new clean. Uh, yeah. but, but what we, it comes in a round, you know, kind of cartridge, or, uh, I'm sorry, a round kind of um, package. Uh, and it's it's pretty big. It's a big piece of foam. What I do is I cut it into quarters, and okay. and put them in a Ziploc bag and just take out one quarter. So one dip cap lasts me four tattoos. Oh, that's smart. Yeah. Yeah, because you really don't need all that because you can kind of flip it. It's like a wedge at that point, and you can kind of yeah. using your machine, you can just flip it uh, around and you, and just dip into the clean part of it. You know I got saying? you. So it's it doesn't even have to sit in a container full of fluid. It's wet enough. Yeah, it's not wet. It's a dry sponge. It's a dry sponge. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I thought it was like, so I thought it was wet. Oh, no, that's interesting. no, yeah. it's dry. I rinse in my rinse cup and then I dry off in that. I just kind of run the needle I in see. that. And uh, no lie, I'll, I'll, do a, I'll do a video on it at some point. When you pull the needle out, it's like shiny, like a brand new needle. There's no, yeah. no anything. Like that's it. wild. But I've never really had that much of a problem where like, you know, I'm going from a darker color to a lighter color. And then all of a sudden my white is turning blue again. Like, yeah. so I guess like just in a regular rinse cap, I'm, I'm getting it clean enough between that and the paper towel that I'm not having problems with, you know, staining or ruining the color. So I never thought to try introducing something, you know, I think, I think to make it important. faster, you know? Yeah. I think Maybe that's, that's what it is. Point. Is it a faster, is it a faster rinse out with the dip cap? And much faster, much faster okay. than I'm not having to run my paper towels, but I, I'm with you. I right. don't necessarily need to, I, I don't. I don't change, I don't completely clean my, uh, my needles in between yeah. colors necessarily. I mix a lot within the cap. So my, my, yeah. my colors are all mixed up. You know, I end up using right. like three whites half the time because I, because I muddy up my whites with so many back and forth. 
Uh, that's that's one thing I have too much of in my setup is white because like if I'm if I have blues or greens like the blue and green can share a white but like a red and yellow they have their own whites so I've always got like you know same three or four whites and you know that way I'm trying to only dirty that white with that specific color for that white you know right right or what I'll do is if I have less white out I'll I'll do white first then the color mm. you know, yeah to keep the white clean yeah yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll do that too. And I tend to, especially with smaller needle configurations, if I'm using a round shader or 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 a, or just a just a round configuration, I I'll um, I, I dip into the corners of my cap, even though I use small caps, and I can kind of keep half of the white clean if that makes any sense. So yeah. like I'll just kind of like I'll just use different corner like dip, there are no corners; it's a circular cap. But you know what I'm saying? Like I'll I'll like dip over on this edge for, with my blues and over on this edge with my yellows, and they and I've kind of got white ink in between. And the only time that doesn't work is if you just if you have a tube that's full of blue and then it'll like spill out all into the white. Yeah, but like if, if you yeah. just if you don't, I mean, you, a lot of times I can just kind of catch the edge of it and and use the same cap of white for you know uh, for different colors. But um, uh, but yeah, yeah, I I uh, I, I like that. Um, and I don't uh, I'm not trying to sell anyone on on either uh, the either of those products that I mentioned, I just used both of those. <laughs> so, here's the link, here's the link. <laughs> here's the link. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, no, I've heard uh, good things about it though, but it's just another thing that I can't see myself like jumping on board with like, you, you know, bounty napkins work great for me. I don't have to rip them like a roll of paper towels. They're already free portioned yeah. and they're clean. They're not, they're lint free. So I don't see the point of going from like a bounty napkin to like a sterilized, whatever whatever wipe that is that Mike DeVries has out. It's just like another Howie. product where I'm like, so Howie loves those things. Yeah, Howie's and everyone that uses them says, oh, they're, they're awesome. Yeah, they might be awesome, but like, you know, it's just another thing that you have to keep stocked in inventory and the day you run out of it, like your whole fucking day is ruined because you're not, you used to wipe them with this towel that doesn't exist anymore. So you I, get more stock, you know? So I try to keep that kind of stuff like simple, ordinary, almost generic, if you will, so that no matter where I go, I can always get a thing of bounty napkins, you know, something mm -hmm. like that. Yeah. Like I, don't, I don't feel like out of my element or my, my, my game is a little off because I don't have my luxuries that I'm used to, you know. Right. Uh, Howie, well, I was tattooing with Howie not too long ago, or before the pandemic, obviously, we were tattooing at a show together, and he was telling me that he, he's using those wipeouts and only uses like one for an entire tattoo. That dude does a lot. I mean, he's not a fast tattooer. He tattoos for like seven oh, hours with a single. Yeah. And There's all no color way. too. So how the hell? Is he, what's he yeah. doing? Like rinsing it into the garbage can, squeezing <laughs> yeah. it out, and going again? Because I I don't get long out of a napkin at all, man. Me either. It's part of my process. I go through so many paper towels because it's like it's part of how I get away from the tattoo for a second. You know what I mean? Like yeah. I need to wipe and and throw a paper towel away and then come back. And if I if I don't have that as part of my routine, I'm I'm stuck trying to use this same towel. I I, uh, I don't know. It disrupts my process. I need to go That's through a lot. That's how I. That's how I feel between black and gray and color. I do more color than anything, but every now and again, I'll do a black and gray tattoo. I'll get through the whole tattoo with like one to two pairs of gloves and like six napkins. And I'm like, how the fuck did that happen? Yeah. Meanwhile, I go through, you know, like a half a ream of napkins and like 12 glove changes on a color tattoo. You know, it's just, yeah. it's a lot. It's a, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a messy process to try to use one napkin through it. I'd love to sit and watch him work and see that happen. That's crazy. Yeah, I, I didn't pay attention when I was working with him, but he did tell me that's what he that's what he did. Um, uh, let's see, what what else do we have here? We've got um, oh, pros and cons of of uh, hard versus soft hitting rotaries was was the last question that came from this group, and this, these weren't all millions questions. They were um, from his shop, so there are other people there that I guess uh, that, that I'm drawing a blank on the name of the shop. It's like forty. Maybe forty six and two. They're 46 based out. Two, yeah. Forty six and two. They're based out of a uh, 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 Fargo area, yeah. North Dakota. Um, uh, really great, All right. great guys. Uh, I've met. That, that is that is a good one. And um, I would say, pros and cons. Hard hitting rotary. You have to have better hand control uh, to keep the skin from getting beat up and too red if you're doing black and gray, or um, you know, getting too overworked if you're doing color work as well. Whereas a soft hitting rotary is going to be more you're pushing with your hand and you're physically doing more of the work than the machine. Um, where you get where the softer hitting rotary is probably going to be uh, more beneficial is building and blending softer, smoother things like say for realism or something really refined and, and detailed. You know, uh, it's going to be more forgiving on the skin and allow you to do more layers. Um, 
A lot of people argue that the Scorpion pen is an extremely soft hitting machine. They want more power. I don't understand what people mean by that because it's probably one of the best saturating machines I've ever used for color. You know, and I think like it's just your hand adjusting to it, understanding how the machine hits and changing your, your hand speed, your technique. You're gonna be stretching and pushing some more or something. Um, but I, I think that all machines you know, generally do have enough power. It's just modifying your, your hand to te technique to make what you need to happen with that skin happen. So I think, I, I think any you know, proficient tattooer it has been tattooing a long time and used a lot of different equipment. It might take a tattoo or two or three to get used to, but you should be able to come close to replicating what you want with anything that's in your hand once you've used it long enough, you know? Yeah. Naturally, you're going to have favorites, but they should all be able to do the same thing, whether soft or hard hitting, I would think. Minus line work. I think you always need something harder hitting for line work. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, and for people who don't know, that Scorpion uh, pen, uh, we've done a review on it before if you go to fireside's youtube channel and ty, ty and i ty did a great breakdown of it with the battery packs and everything but that uh, actually has an adjustment uh in the in the pen to to adjust how hard or soft it hits and i, I always kept it kind of right in the middle of hard and soft and just recently i've moved it to like the full uh hard position and yeah. um i like it better i i, I it, just with the way that Same. i work yeah, I think um, when I when I use too much give on that machine, the skin gets a little more beat up because I'm pushing harder to make it happen uh, versus setting it. I set it like one click off of hard, uh, sometimes two clicks off of hard, which would be like 15 minutes on the clock, basically, mm -hmm. is two clicks. And one click off is, I guess, like, you know, two o'clock-ish, one, one, one thirty-ish, kind of. Um, that that uh, seems to make the dot smaller in the skin, uh, a more refined look. And that has been working out amazing with bug pins as well for me for black and color and saturation. And like using that same machine to go from black and gray to color work is kind of something I never did. I always needed a softer hitting machine, whereas I don't, you know, yeah. with a uh, scorpion pen. It's, it's soft enough or hard enough, depending on your hand technique, you know? Yeah. And that's a super light machine too, even with the battery on the back. Cause that I'm using the disposable grip that they have with it. And, uh, and it gets the job done, man. You know, it really does. I, I love the, I haven't, I haven't ordered the disposable grips, but I've held them using, or not using your machine, but like just trying to feel them out on your machine. I really like their disposable grips. I, I don't know why and I ever ordered them. They're, yeah, they're, whatever rubber they're using on those things, it's, it's got some give to it, but not too much give. So it's not too spongy, um, but it grips to the glove. It's, it's almost like it's not tacky, but it's almost a tackier rubber than a hard rubber would be. It really, like when your glove is dry, it just clings to your gloves, man. It's super comfortable, uh, especially the, the larger one. I guess it's like the one inch grip that they have for that. That thing's awesome. Huh. Yeah. There's zero vibration in that machine. That's one reason I keep going back to it for like my large work for shading and coloring. You know, yeah. um, I don't care if there's vibration in a liner, especially if it's efficient. But if I can have no vibration through like, you know, six hours of my day, I, it's better than having all that vibration through the whole process, I feel, you know? Mm -hmm. And well, he did one of my favorite, that. Yeah, one of my favorite things still about that machine is is the mm -hmm. uh, the needle depth adjustment being a, a small little uh, wheel oh, in the yeah. back rather than the yeah. entire grip. Uh, <laughs> seems like a small thing, but I really like that. Same. I For me, it still seems backwards. I yeah. wish, you know, counterclockwise is needle down where I think clockwise should be needle down. Yeah. But I, and that every now and again, I'll be like, ah, oh, shit, I turned it the wrong way again. You know, yeah. Even as long as I've been using it, I'll still turn that damn thing the wrong way. Yeah. Uh, but it is, uh, I think that's nice how the, the grip locks into place and you're not twisting a grip in a whole machine. So that dial on top, when you use it with their batteries, especially, it's like a tattoo machine. The battery is always in the back where it belongs, mm. no matter where the needle depth is where anyone else with the clip on battery, you know, you get your needle depth, then you got to spin or twist the battery again mm -hmm. to put the battery back where it belongs, you know? Right, right. So it was, um, I mean, super well planned and thought out. I'm really curious to see, he's got another version of that Scorpion pen that was supposed to come out, but the pandemic kind of fucked everything up for him this year. And he's got a more powerful motor in it now and some more refinements that make the machine even more durable than it already is. I don't remember the date that that thing was released, but the one that I'm using daily is the same one I've been using since day one with, I mean, zero problems with that machine, man. So I, I would say it's definitely one of the most durable and 
long lasting machines I've ever used. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I, and it only... requires very little work too, like a tiny drop of oil on the slider. When I remember to do it, I could go like two months before I remember to put a drop of oil on that damn thing and it still runs great, you know? Oh yeah. I, I forgot about that too. I don't know the last time I did that. Yeah. It's like you, that plastic slide on the metal. I truly don't even think it needs it, but I will notice like that the machine seems to be a little faster when I do oil it, you know? Hmm. So maybe it's less strain on the motor if you do oil it, but it totally doesn't seem necessary. I agree with that. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to do that now that you mention it, though. I, I, hadn't, I hadn't thought about it. Yeah, the only uh, issue that I have with mine, I have a small short in the RCA jack, and it's, it's very um, sporadic, but when the, my battery pack, I've got the cheap Amazon battery pack, yeah. and when it kind of spins, you know, it'll, it, it just has the one point of contact. It's not like, I'm sure if I use their actual battery pack that locks into the Oh, the yeah. cord area that, that I wouldn't have the problem. But as that battery pack spins as I'm working, I'll hit a point where, it, where I'll lose power and I just have to readjust the battery. Uh, you know, I notice that too on say um, every now and again, because I, I have all these machines still, once in a blue, I'll pull out a Zion to do a tattoo. You know, I've got mm -hmm. that thing in the drawer still. That battery pack on top of the Zion is such a loose fit. I have to put the battery in just the right spot to make that machine run. If the battery goes too far into the RCA, the machine won't run. Huh. It's so, I, I think that the, um, the metal on those Amazon batteries, it's not flexible. I've actually tried to tighten them and it, it's cast, it will just snap off. Uh, so that could be, it might be loose on the fitting. Make sure your RCA, how it's got, um, it looks like a hex bolt. Make sure that thing's completely tightened into place as well. Yeah. Uh, but if, if that were one of the first generation ones, it, it might even be worth it to send out to service. Does it get hot? when you have no connection or not? No. Because no. a friend of mine had one she got and hers was getting hot. And I said, I've never had any problems with these machines getting hot. And um, I talked to Christian from Make Machines about it. And he said that the, uh, the isolating material that they used in the first, first run of the ink machines um, was breaking down and it was causing a contact where it wasn't supposed to be contact and the machine was uh, like heating up because of it. And then they would just take that piece out and change. I think they changed from like, a rubber washer to a fiber washer or vice something like that it was like a simple part that they that they upgraded and that took care of all the problems so hmm. okay. it could be if that was a first generation one that that could be the problem yeah i got it from you i don't know how old it is uh when they first came out probably right yeah yeah i, I don't know i got it from you so I, a year I and a half it. ago yeah about, yeah i think that was the that was the first generation of them but okay. i never had any problems with that machine either yeah yeah, uh, it, and it, it maybe it is the batteries. I have two batteries, and it does it with both of them, but they are both Amazon batteries. So, you know, may, right. maybe that's just something with the Amazon batteries. I don't know. Without having to buy the whole TPS 500 setup, when he releases that new battery with the controls on the battery, mm -hmm. I would put it on there just because the way it magnetizes and sits upright, it's up and out of the way, and it's super shallow to the machine. Mm -hmm. um, I, no matter the way he has that set up, even somebody with the largest hand, that thing's out of the way. It's it starts at the height of where a coil would sit on top of a regular grip. Hmm. So it's, it's not like a bulky pack that's in the way in the back at all. Um, it's designed really well. And there's two magnets on it that hold it in place. Yeah. And it doesn't use the RCA. It uses the um, positive negative terminals to make oh. connection. Okay. So it's a super solid connection on there. It's a very durable connection. Um, hmm. And it doesn't, I've never had them wear out on my batteries yet. I've never lost connection. Uh, it's, it's reliable and true. I'm like, I guess, plugging in and out an RCA all the time. You're eventually going to have to replace the RCA. I believe that just screws in and screws out, though, that you can order that part right on ink machines and get a okay. whole new RCA for probably like 20 bucks. You know? he, he hasn't made that, um, that battery pack with the controls on it available yet? And no, only because of the pandemic. Okay. Like, they kind of put the brakes on everything for a bit. They were having some problems there for a while, too. It got, they had a, a, a pretty bad... Uh, upswing with coronavirus because they, they believed in like herd immunity mm -hmm. and people weren't social distancing and then I guess once it really blew up they were like well our <laughs> what we thought was going to go down didn't go down so I guess we should start doing shit now yeah but um yeah. I think yeah. a lot of people ended up in a, <laughs> in a bad place with this and it makes sense that manufacturing needed to stop because what was the point in shelling out all that money for a battery with a controller on the back when nobody was tattooing anyway, you know? Mm -hmm. yeah. So I think it's, I think it, we'll see it in the next six months or so. Okay. I'll keep my eyes open for it. 
Well, yeah. cool. We're, we're about an hour or so in. I've got a discussion panel with a guy and a few other folks at, uh, in about 40 minutes. So uh, if anyone, if no one has any other questions, we might just wrap this one up uh, and uh, we'll make it available. I think that, that Guy and Gabe will make this available for replay instantly. So if you missed any part of it or uh, uh, you can rewatch, and I think we'll probably also release it through Fireside on our YouTube channel next week. Uh, just to uh, to get it to folks who who weren't able to 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 get on here, but I, uh, man, I appreciate it. That was awesome. I, I, I know that hey. I'm, yeah. people love that. People love that stuff, and it's it's funny because it's you know people uh, tattooers are a lot of times hesitant to ask a lot of these questions because they feel like they should already know. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> like, and so it's, yeah. it's nice. You to, know, it is a weird thing because for me, tattooing, as long as I've been tattooing, I, I don't think that it's something that people need only because it hasn't been for a while for me. But then seeing people's replies and comments of how grateful they are and they're like, dude, that's exactly what I needed. Thanks for that. You know, obviously, we should be sharing this information. I don't, I don't think that, you know, if people are professionally tattooing anyway, it's great that they're getting the information they need. It doesn't need to be a secret society. We don't need to take like a color blending technique to the grave with us. We can share it amongst each other, man. I think it's awesome. And also uh, thanks to Million of 46 uh, and 2 Tattoo for giving us a couple questions here today. I yeah, yeah, that, that was great. Yeah, we can always depend on Million to do, to, to chime in. He's a, he's a, he's a, uh, uh, a, a great person to have watching the show because he points out all types of things that I'm missing and uh, and is always willing to share ideas or ask questions and we uh, really appreciate pe Million and, and 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 so many other Fireside uh, viewers who are who are liking the, it's it's awesome man we're so yeah. happy to have uh, have a community yeah. like this so cool man thanks, well, it's good everyone to, and thanks for having me back on Jake yeah absolutely Let, let's uh, I hope one day we can actually see each other in real life. Oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> soon, maybe. soon, man. Soon. I can drive out there. I won't take a plane. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. I feel you. So, cool, right. man. Tell tell the family I said hello. Hi, Robert. Have a uh, good to see you for a second, Robin. If you're in there anywhere, uh, and uh, I'll uh, I'll talk to you soon, man. Thanks a lot. All right, bro. You got it, bro. Thanks. Later. Hey, thanks again for watching. Please be sure to like and comment and subscribe to our channel so you can stay up to date with all of the things that we are doing. Uh, if you would like to buy us a drink, please support us on Patreon. There's a button somewhere around here that allows you to do that. You can also visit our website and subscribe to our newsletter so you know where we're headed and what we're doing. And while you're there, please check out our merchandise page. Buy yourself a fancy new Fireside t-shirt. Thank you for supporting the Fireside Tattoo Network, and we'll see you on the next episode.